to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter number two. Last week, we talked about um, how uh, some of the titles that were given to Jesus in the Gospels were linked to Old Testament prophecy. Specifically, we talked about the title Son of David and the Shepherd, the Good Shepherd. Uh, we went back to Ezekiel and to Isaiah and looked at how uh, prophetic scriptures that were written uh, in one case more than 400 years before Christ, the other more than 700 years before Christ, were completely fulfilled in Jesus Christ. This morning, uh, we have titled the message, um, Christmas in the Old Testament. Um, Christmas is an interesting holiday. Now, I want, to, I want to process something with you, so I hope you'll allow me uh, just a moment to kind of to clean up some things that are going on culturally and some debates and arguments. I've seen a couple things online uh, this past week, and I've heard a few questions from even our church family about this issue, so I'm going to address this. I think I've done it before, but, but I want to do it again, and that is about Christ, uh, Christmas being a pagan holiday, okay, um, and the use of a Christmas tree and that being an unholy thing, all right? So let me, let me just clarify for this, all right? Where the day December 25th comes from is not actually the day that we believe Jesus was born on. Uh, there's a, a season that we have an idea of when he was probably born, uh, but we don't know the specific day. December 25th is not the exact day. And uh, the, there has been a, 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 an assertion that December 25th is actually a pagan holiday, and therefore we should not be having Christmas on that day, and it, which in fact is true that December 25th was originally a pagan holiday, all right? Um, this was following, this is the uh, fifth day after, or I'm sorry, the fourth day after the winter solstice, and, uh, and uh, the pagan worshipers of the Greek region, they identified uh, December 25th as the day when days began to get longer again. And so you had the shortest day of the year, December 21st, and then a few days later, December 25th, uh, the days start getting longer again. And so these pagan worshipers would say this is the, the birthday of the sun, S-U-N, as in the sun was beginning to grow again, all right? Um, that was co-opted later by Christians uh, to just say, hey, tell you what, we're going to celebrate this as the birthday of the sun, S-O-N, all right? And so it was adopted as a day of celebration uh, to celebrate the birth of Christ not really being sure exactly when his birthday uh, was. If that bothers you uh, on that, feel free to worship on the 26th. Celebrate Christmas on the 24th. Whatever you want to do, it's good. Uh, I don't want you to get caught up on that day. The, the point is not that we know for sure this was the birthday of Jesus. It's just designated as a tradition for us to remember the moment that God himself chose to intervene in, into flesh, stepping into this sinful world to do something for you and I that we couldn't do for ourselves, namely live a perfect life and to be a perfect sacrifice for our sin. So we're just doing it to remember and celebrate, all right? Then there's the assertion that the Christmas tree is a pagan uh, thing that was used in Celtic and, and uh, the Baltic regions as a symbol of, of pagan celebrations, and in fact, it was. And so Christians, over time in Europe, co-opted the Christmas tree and said, we're going to use this evergreen as a symbol of eternal life, everlasting life, uh, and uh, we're just going to use that as a, a symbol to celebrate a Christian holiday, okay? You can take pretty much everything that we do in terms of ceremony and ritual and even music and those kind of things, and you can make the assertion that somehow we got some of these pieces from worldly sources, pagan sources. And you would be right about all that. Here's the deal. If it tips you over, if it's something that you have an uh, issue with, that you think a Christmas tree is an unholy thing, then don't have a Christmas tree, all right? Personally, it's not a, not a problem for me. I'm happy to have a Christmas tree. In fact, I love to see those decorations. My wife and daughter are really good about that, and I, in part, really enjoy the way they torture my son Jesse by making him reach all the high stuff because he hates the process right? And I get great satisfaction out of watching him have to do stuff that he's miserable doing. It's a twisted thing, but it's because I love him, all right? So we have a good time with the decorations and all, all those kind of things, and we enjoy that, all right? Here's the deal. Whatever your heart is convicted about, if you believe that that's something that's inappropriate, 
and you do that to you, it's sin. To me, that's not sin. I don't have time to go into the scriptures on it, but I just want to address that briefly to just say, don't try to project that conviction on other people. All right? That's, that's between you and the Lord. That's between me and the Lord, okay? We're going to deal with that on, on our own. And if in any way you feel like you're, you're somehow worshiping some pagan god, then that's, that's the deal. Let me throw another one at you right here just to really confuse you and get you all mixed up. The truth is, uh, we worship on Sunday because it's the first day of the week, amen? Yeah. Well, honestly, we don't know what the first day of the week is. There's no calendar that takes us all the way back to the Garden of Eden that says that Sunday is definitely the first of the seven days. And then if you did the math and you went backwards on that and subtracted seven from today over and over and over and over and over again, day one would be Sunday. Actually, we don't know that. In fact, the name Sunday is also a pagan day. Sun was someone that they, uh, the pagans worshipped as the, the sun god, beginning the week's cycle. Here's the deal. Sabbath being on Saturday. We don't know that Saturday was the Sabbath either. Right? In fact, Saturday, that awesome name, comes from the worship of Saturn. Right? So what's the deal? What am I saying? What's the point? When it comes to this stuff about what day's what and what holiday and what tools you can use to celebrate those things, here's the deal. That is your heart's issue Nobody else's. All right, we worship on Sunday, and we call that the first day of the week. And in our calendar and in our culture, it is the first day of our week. And that's why we do it on that day. Why? Because Jesus rose on the first day of the week. That's the reason we worship to celebrate that. The reason that we don't worship on Saturday, even uh, that, that would be our Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, not the first day of the week, but the last day of the week, we call that supposed to be a day of rest for us. And I hope it is for you. But if you don't have Saturday as a day of rest, I pray you've got another day of rest. Now, because we all need rest as part of our journey. And our culture doesn't promote that, but you need that. But we don't know that Saturday is definitely the seventh day of the week. And we don't know that Sunday is definitely the first day of the week based on day one of creation and day two of creation, day three of creation, and that timeline that we see in Genesis. We just don't have a calendar that takes us that far back. Okay? But we have taken those days and we have co-opted those and said this is what we're going to do because we want to honor God and there needs to be a plan and a structure for that. It's the same thing with Christmas. We picked a day to celebrate the day that God was incarnate in the flesh. And if you feel like worshiping or celebrating Christmas in June, have at it. That'd be awesome. Me, I'm going to do it in, in, at the Christmas uh, time in December. Is when I'm going to celebrate because I love that movie, It's a Wonderful Life. And I just love Jimmy Stewart, and I want to watch that. And that's when it comes on. They don't show that in June. So that's Christmas for me. That was a joke. That was not a spiritual reason. Okay. All right. Again, no, no con condemnation to anyone who feels strongly about those issues. But don't project that on other Christians. That's between you and the Lord. Everybody with me on that? Say amen. Okay. And if, you, if you're online, I hope you said amen online too because that's true. All right. Here we go, Colossians chapter number 2, we are going to look at um, Christ in the Old Testament. The, name, the word Christmas actually just means the Mass on Christ's day, right? And that comes from the early uh, Catholic Church, and they just designated this day with that label. Uh, but we want to look to see Christ in the Old Testament. Here's the story. The entire Old Testament is pointing us to Jesus Christ. The entire story, all of it, is pointing us towards Jesus Christ. The implementation of the law, the implementation of all the traditions, all the stories that you see there, which are true stories. These are not made-up stories. None of it's allegorical. This is literal history from Genesis 1 all the way through Malachi. Say amen. It's history. And it's the best record that we have of history before Christ. No other secular record is as comprehensive as the Old Testament. And throughout the Old Testament, we have hundreds of references to the Messiah, 92 specific prophecies that he would fulfill in his lifetime. Today, we want to look at some of the traditions that were established in the law, in the book of Leviticus, and it deals with the feasts and how they point to Christ. But begin with me in Colossians chapter number 2. I want to read verses 16 and 17. If you're there, say amen. I'm reading from the English Standard Version this morning. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you 
in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Everybody say that last verse with me right there. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Talking about the feast, talking about the holy days, these are all things that were instituted in the Old Testament to point us to the day when the Messiah would change the world and to change our eternal destiny. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word and we ask that as we look through these different uh, feasts and, and we're just going to be able to survey those because we just don't have time to go in depth in each one of those. But we're going to survey these feasts and I pray that you'd help us to see that this was your plan all along. From the very beginning, you knew that we would need a Redeemer, and you knew it could only be you. So I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to see in each of these traditions, in each of these uh, festivals that were given to the Jews in the Old Testament, uh, you had us in mind throughout all of them, and that you always intended to be the substitute to take the punishment for our sins and to redeem us, to reconcile us back to yourself. God, we're so grateful for that. Make yourself known to us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. So Colossians 2 says, hey, we're going we're gonna to make sure that we understand all of these things to do with holy days and feasts and food and drink. All these things were a, a shadow of things that were to come. Christ is the substance. Now turn with me back to the book of, of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter number 23, Leviticus chapter number 23. Now I made a promise last week that we would turn the middle section of lights on back there. So could I get somebody to go out there and turn those lights on? Just the middle row in there. Because I had some folks that uh, wanted to be able to read their Bibles better. Is that good? Okay. All right. Sounds good. Those who walk in darkness hate the light. So if you're gripping about that, just pray about it. The Lord will help you. All right. Um, so we're in Leviticus uh, chapter number 23. Now here's the challenge. I see you better. So if you're not turning in your Bibles, I will look at you and wait. So take your Bibles. We've opened this door, right? This is open. I can see you good now, all right? Leviticus chapter number 23, and we're going to come back to this passage a few times. So as we turn away from it, keep your finger there, or if you've got a, a, you know, a marker or something, a bookmark, put it there and locate it so you can quickly go back, because we're going to be in 23, and then we're going to bounce back to the New Testament and go back and forth. Leviticus chapter number 23, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 4. If you're ready, say amen. Here we go. The, uh, these are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. That's the first one. The 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, but you shall present a food offering to the Lord for seven days on the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. Everybody say ordinary work. Does that mean that you can't do abnormal or unordinary work? Well, Jesus, just real briefly, he said, who, if they had a donkey that fell into the ditch on the Sabbath day, would leave it there until the next day? Nobody would do that. Of course, you'd get the donkey out, all right? So as we're talking about these things, I don't want you to get so legalistic as to say that, man, he gave us these, these things in the Old Testament. If we're not keeping this stuff, somehow we're, we're in sin, all right? In the New Testament, we just read in Colossians, this was all intended to point us to Christ. Say, point us to Christ. Everybody say, point us to Christ. So the first feast that we're going to look at is the Passover that's identified. Now, what is the Passover? The Passover is uh, the celebration that was put in place to mark the deliverance of the children of Israel out of Egypt and the slavery and the bondage that they had been in for 400 years down in Egypt. It's celebrated uh, in, uh, in their month. I, I'm going to get the, the pronunciation is wrong. I do it every time. It's Nisan. Uh, that's late March, early April, all right? And that's where the idea that, that Jesus' sacrifice was probably somewhere around what we call Easter because he celebrated Passover right before he was offered up as a sacrifice. And that's why we have that time frame uh, for when, when we celebrate Easter or the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the Passover was given uh, to the Jews to remember 
that deliverance out of Egypt. It also marked the protection during the 10th plague when the death angel was unleashed over Egypt and all of the firstborn of all the, the, the sons, the males of the children of men and of animals was all slaughtered in that night. But they had that deal where God said, I want you to offer up a sacrificial lamb. I want you to take its blood and you're going to put it on the doorpost and on the lintel across that. And uh, when the death angel comes through, it'll see the blood and it will pass over your home and move on down the line. And so Passover celebrates the protection of God's people from death and the consequences of the death angel from that 10th plague. They were to consume the entire lamb. Every bit of it was supposed to be eaten in the course of that night. It's interesting, the Passover that Jesus celebrated with him in Matthew 26. Let's go there. Go with me. Matthew chapter number 26. As Jesus celebrated his last Passover, he instituted what we call the Lord's Supper. It's our communion that we observe. And in Matthew chapter number 26, beginning in verse number 26, I love to hear pages turn in church. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many of, for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. This is where he institutes the Lord's Supper, and he gives us the new covenant in his blood. Now, at this point, he had not been offered up as a sacrifice. So they're celebrating Passover, this celebration of the deliverance of the Jews out of Egypt, and the disciples knew what Passover was about. But as he, uh, as Jesus explains this new covenant, they didn't really get that. They didn't understand that. It wasn't until Jesus died and his blood was shed for their sins that they came to understand what he was really implementing here. And of course, in 1 Corinthians 11, we have Paul reinstituting that or, or confirming that with the New Testament church as something that we should regularly observe uh, with no particular schedule, but it should be regular so that we again remember what Jesus Christ has done. Now, here you have a story from the deliverance of the Jews out of Egypt more than a thousand years before Jesus lived and had this last Passover with his disciples where he instituted the Lord's Supper. And you see a connection over that entire span, the Passover feast where the lamb was offered and with the shedding of the lamb's blood, protection was provided from death. Well, what did Jesus do when he died on the cross so many years later? Through the shedding of his blood, he dealt with death, hell, and the grave so that you and I could have life. Again, Colossians 2, all of these things are a foreshadowing of what was to come. Christ is the substance. The Passover was always pointing to Jesus. And uh, you guys, many of you know um, that, that Julian Lopez, pastor at Roots Church uh, here in town, is a dear friend of mine, and, and uh, we, we have fun with this, um, talking about this story. He's told it to me more than once, where he grew up in a, in a home where um, his, his father was Hispanic, but his, his uh, mom was, was Jewish, and so he kind of grew up with uh, multiple traditions in uh, Southern California, and they would celebrate some of these things when they went primarily to their grandfather's uh, house, and they would do the whole Passover. And the whole Passover deal is much more than just the meal, okay? It's, it's a long process. There's all kinds of things. There's a gift that's taken and hidden, and they have to go and search for the gift. And there's all kinds of symbolism that's inco incorporated into the celebration of Passover. And Julian got saved later in life. Uh, he wasn't uh, saved as a child. And he remembers, you know, all those traditions and going through it. But then after he accepted Christ and he began to study Scripture, and to see these connections between Passover and Jesus being offered as the sacrifice, he goes back to the family get-together, and they're doing Passover together, and he sees all these things, and all of a sudden it's dawning on him, 
well, the gift is Jesus. Oh, my goodness. The protection is the blood of Christ. And, and he's looking at his family going, how do you guys not see this? Right? And he's blown away and he's all excited because he sees Christ in the center of that. And I love to hear him tell that story of how real that came to him and how God connected the dots in his heart between something that he had done so many centuries before, the completed work of Christ, and then his life today. All the way through the story, Christ is the substance, and you were the goal. Christ is the substance because he was coming for you and he was coming for me. Isn't that amazing? All of history tied together. The Passover instituted the Lord's Supper, Jesus did, and revealed to us that he was the sacrificial lamb. Number two, go back to Leviticus chapter number 23. Told you we were going to go back and forth. Back to chapter 23, and we're going to look at verse number six. We just read it. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Unleavened bread simply is bread without yeast. Now, why is this important? This was instituted to mark and remember how quickly they left Egypt. They left so fast that they didn't have time to add any leaven to the bread, all right? They didn't have time to put any yeast in there to travel with. And so all the mixings and makings they had uh, for uh, bread they took with them, had no yeast with it. And, uh, you know, for, for a, a redneck from southern uh, the south, uh, not having any yeast in there, Man, that's like not having butter for your biscuit. That's just not okay. You're not supposed to do that, right? Okay, but there's a reason. They left so fast they couldn't put yeast in the bread, so they ate unleavened bread. This tradition or this feast was put into place as a festival to help them remember how quickly they had to leave to get out. So they took off. Now, it marks uh, a particular day. He actually gives them the exact day that they're supposed to engage in that. It's the seven days that follow the Passover. And so you've got three feasts. We're going to talk about the Feast of First Fruits in just a minute that really kind of are intertwined, all right? They're not the same. Sometimes people combine these and act like they're all part of Passover. They're not. They're distinct, and they're for specific reasons, all right? Passover marks that deliverance uh, out of Egypt. Unleavened bread marks God's provision as he provided for them coming out uh, into the wilderness area. But most importantly, this is symbolic of the fact that there's no yeast, of him pulling the Jews out of a worldly situation. Yeast is representative of sin. And he says, I want you to eat this unleavened bread as a symbol of the idea that I am calling you to holiness, that I'm calling you to remove the sin from your life. When you left Egypt, when you left the world, you're supposed to leave all of that ungodliness behind. And we know the story of the time in the wilderness that they, they really struggled with that. Many of them wanted to go back to Egypt. Uh, many of them were complaining because they didn't have the food that they had in Egypt. They were afraid of the challenges they, they were going to face. They were constantly griping and complaining uh, to, to Moses. That's how we know the Jews were Baptists. And uh, come on, that was pretty good. That was pretty good right there, right? Okay, I'm a Baptist. I'm allowed to say that. All right, all right. Some of you didn't know I was a Baptist. I didn't mean to ruin it for you. I apologize right there, okay? All right. <laughs> That was Y'all were a little slow to catch on to that one. Yeah, stay focused. Here we go. All right. So they were complaining. They were griping. But when they left that, God was saying, I want you to leave all the worldliness behind, and I'm calling you to be a special people. Not special as in righteous in your own works, but special as in called out, sanctified, set apart for a purpose. That's what the Feast of the Unleavened Bread is about. And it begins... It's for, it covers the seven days after Passover. So you got Passover, and the next seven days deal with the, uh, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. At the Last Supper, when Jesus instituted back again in Matthew 26, where he told him to take of the bread uh, and to eat of it, he said, this is my body which is broken for you. And he's identified in John chapter number 6, verse number 35 here, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me 
shall never thirst. Again, in verse number 51, he continues, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. He identified himself as the bread of life. Again, the feast of unleavened bread was always pointing towards Jesus, the source of sinless nourishment, not contaminated by the world, no, no yeast of sin. He was pure and he was holy and he was the perfect provision to not only redeem our souls but to nourish our souls. And oh my goodness, do we not need the regular working of Jesus Christ in our life to strengthen us, to nourish us, and to just help us have the strength to go a little further. Amen? Man, that only comes through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, the feast of unleavened bread, was pointing towards Jesus. Then, the feast, back again in, in Leviticus chapter number 20. Turn with me again. Leviticus 23. We're going to jump now to verse number 10. Leviticus 23, verse number 10. If you're ready, say amen. amen. All right. Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheep of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. Now, I didn't have Carla put verse number 11 on there, but verse number 11 talks about the, the two loaves that will be uh, made and brought forward. Let me explain this. First fruits. Now, again, you got a relationship between Passover uh, where they're celebrating the protection from uh, the death angel and the deliverance out of Egypt, the sacrificial lamb that was offered for them. The immediate seven days after that deals with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where God sanctified them and set them aside for His purpose in preparation for the bread of life, Jesus Christ, to be broken to give them life, eternal life, forever. Then you have, there in verse uh, number 10, you have the Feast of First Fruits, where He says, when you come into that land, I want you to bring a, a, uh, an offering from the spring harvest that is going to celebrate the goodness of God. Now, this overlaps with uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Passover ends, unleavened bread begins. It begins, the Feast of the Fruits, First Fruits, begins on the third day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that's why these are often intermingled with each other because timeline-wise, they're just sequential and they overlap, all right? But they have two distinct purposes here. The Feast of the First Fruits that begins on the third day of the uh, Feast of the Unleavened Bread uh, is celebrating the provision and the, the goodness of God, but it also marks the day that Jesus rose from the dead. It's the same day. So here you have instituted at the outset of the Old Testament law a feast celebrating the first fruits only to later see Jesus resurrected on exactly that day. Check out 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and verse number 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Paul understood. He saw this. The Jews got this symbolism. The day that Jesus rose, when he uses this phrase, that Jesus was the first fruits, they immediately associated that with the feast of first fruits. Jesus talks about the harvest um, that is plentiful, and yet the workers are few. And he says, I'm going to give you a new covenant. I'm going to give you this new plan that you're going to be involved in. And the harvest of grain uh, that comes here has to do with souls, the souls that are going to be harvested. And what you see in this harvest of grain uh, from this, uh, this uh, first fruits that's identified beginning with Jesus Christ is the process by which he was going to redeem and harvest many souls throughout time. That immediately connects to the fourth feast that we're going to talk about. And I'm just going to cover these four, and we're going to stop here. I'm going to hit three more next week, so I want you to come back and finish this with me. But the fourth one, I want to connect these, because timeline-wise, they all go together. They're all in the springtime uh, festivals in terms of the Jewish calendar. So you have the first fruits, which is Jesus Christ. Then you have the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost, as we would call it today. Go back to Leviticus 23. One more time this morning. 
We'll go back there again next week. But Leviticus 23 and verse number 16. Leviticus 23, verse number 16. He says, you shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh day. Then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. This is where he talks about the two loaves. I'm sorry, verse number 17. It wasn't verse 11. You shall bring your dwelling places, two loaves of bread to be uh, waved, made of two tenths of an ephah. All right. And what you have in verse number 16 of chapter 23 is the, the identification of the Feast of Weeks. Now, following Passover, that's the seventh day that's identified, there's supposed to be seven weeks, 49 days. So Passover, you have seven full weeks, and then the last day of that at the end of it is considered the 50th day. We call that uh, Pentecost because this comes from the Greek word penta, just meaning 50. And so we identify that as the 50th day. This again, draws attention to God's provision for the children of Israel as they wander through uh, the wilderness. Uh, but more specifically, it points us to Christ as he would be offered up and he would become the first fruits, bringing in the harvest of grain and the two loaves that were identified there in verse number 17 of Leviticus 23 speak to the idea that no longer is it going to be a harvest of just one type of people, but both now there's going to be two types of people, both Jews and and Gentiles. So from the very beginning of the Feast of Weeks, in the beginning of the Levitical law, the idea was always portrayed, it was always presented that Christ would take redemption beyond just the Jews to everybody else. All of this pointing to Christ, the substance. All of it pointing towards one convergence in Jesus Christ that will fulfill all prophecy. Everything, a shadowing of the things that were to come. Here you have this celebration of the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, where he says this harvest is going to be offered, the Holy Spirit's going to be given. Jesus would give birth to his church. Matthew 9 37, Jesus says this. He said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. In his mind, it was always about the harvest. Always about the harvest. And throughout the Old Testament, all of it was pointing towards the day when there would be this great harvest, this great harvest, this great harvest. Acts 1, verse number 4, Jesus gave instructions to them. He says, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father which he said, you heard from me. What's he talking about? He's talking about the Holy Spirit, the promise that I gave you. In verse number 8 of chapter 1, he says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. It's not a coincidence that on Pentecost, during the celebration of the Feast of Weeks and the harvest of grain, this harvest that's going to be opened up beyond the Jews to the rest of the world, that in Acts chapter number 2 you find this great message preached by Peter on the day of Pentecost where we have 3,000 souls that are saved. A great harvest, Jesus. Again, the fields are wide in the harvest. The harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. All of this from the beginning of the Levitical law all the way until the fulfillment of it in Jesus Christ was all pointing to him. Him. Sometimes we read the Christmas story. We quote a few verses from Isaiah. and We look at the stories from Matthew and Luke and we see all these great dramatic scenes and the angels singing and the shepherds coming to worship and the wise men coming to give their offerings to him. And we say, man, what a beautiful story that is. Oh, my goodness. That is such a small piece of the story. It's just a sampling of the story. The story has gone on for thousands of years, all pointing us to Jesus Christ. So he was always the substance, and you were always the goal. And the story that you read beginning in Genesis 1-1 all the way through Revelation 21, it's all glorifying him. It all hinges on him. And it's such an honor that he would include me in his story. Amen?
Next week, we're going to go into the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Festival of Lights. But this week, I wanted you to see these, these feasts that were identified at the beginning of the, the Jewish calendar, the springtime of their year. See these celebrations that were established in Leviticus, all of them pointing to Jesus Christ. And then Jesus Christ being the fulfillment of every one of them. Would you bow your heads with me? I ask Brother Glenn if he'll come to the stage. He's going to close us in prayer in just a moment. And I want you to take a moment. And I want you to reflect, to search your own heart. Ask the Lord to help you search your heart. And I want you to ask yourself this question. Do I see the entirety of Scripture as the story of Jesus Christ, or have I very narrowly included just the Gospels and said this is Jesus' story? Ask yourself that question. How do I see the Old Testament? Is that the story of Jesus as well? I want to challenge you. As you pray, as you search God's face, that you would ask God to show you how this is much bigger than just a 33-year span of one man walking on the face of the earth, but that for thousands of years, more than 6,000 years, Jesus has been actively working, God has been actively working to make a way for your salvation. In all of the stories and all of the festivals and all of the laws and everything that we see in the epistles and the prophets and the psalms and the histories, all of it, all of it, all of it points to Jesus as our Messiah and as our Savior. God, help us this day to see it for what it really is. Brother Glenn, come close us in prayer. Father, I thank you for the message today. It's near and dear to my heart as a uh, young Christian. There were so many questions that I had reading through Scripture and understanding individual stories, but uh, it was like a jigsaw puzzle. And then I started <clears throat> looking at and studying the tabernacle, these feasts that Alan speaks of. I started looking at your Jewish people. And as I, come, as I came to understand what you were teaching through that, Lord, the pieces started falling into place. And I could see Scripture in its entirety. And that was such, such a blessing and a gift. And Lord, for those of us who are here today, I would pray, if they want to see the big picture, look at your people. Lord Jesus, you said that salvation is of the Jews. And I didn't understand that then, but I do now. You are our salvation but to help me understand that, you showed me your people. And I thank you for that. And as Alan said today, the Feast of Weeks ushered in another era of your salvation time, the salvation of the Gentiles. So now we see your people, the Jewish people and Gentiles, united through the cross, what you did for the entire world, not just for them, but for the entire world, for those of us who are non-Jews. Lord, we just thank you so much. Now we can see from Genesis through Revelation, we can see it all does point to you. And we thank you so much for your word and the power that it gives to us and the life that it breathes into us. Lord, we just thank you for the gift of your word. 
and how it speaks to us. And Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the gift of your blood. As we go out here today, Lord, I pray that each of us would be thinking of you and your sacrifice. And as they look at your word, Lord, that they would see in all of it, all from Genesis through Revelation, they would see you. They would see you. Lord Jesus, we love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.